Executive Director of the Benedict 16th Institute. And we're here among other things to learn more and uh, celebrate the, the resurging Catholic culture in Houston and the people who've helped make it happen, but in particular to honor the new B16 Teen Writing Fellow who won a contest put together by Sarah Cortez and the Catholic Literary Arts of Catholic Literary Arts, uh, and which was judged by our poet in residence, James Matthew Wilson, who I never tire of repeating the thing that Dana told me privately and just rang about in my head since that Dana Joya says James Matthew Wilson is the future of Catholic letters uh, in America. And we cer certainly, uh, to all of us who are familiar with his work, um, that is uh, an accolade well earned. Archbishop, could you lead us in prayer? And Sure. Now, welcome, everyone. So glad you joined us this evening. Let us bow our heads to make give thanks to the one who makes this all possible. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the blessings you have poured into our lives. We give you thanks, first and above all, for the gift of your Son, who came to set us free from sin and death on this day when we celebrate the exaltation of his holy cross, the instrument of torture and death that becomes the instrument of life for us, paving, paving the way to eternal life with you. We give you thanks for the talents with which you have imbued us and for all those who use those talents to give you glory and lead more and more souls closer to you, that they might know your truth, love, and goodness and come to be saved. Bless our time together this evening. Uh, bless all we do, that it might be for your glory and the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, we thank you for all those who contribute to uh, the good of the church, who contribute and support for Benedict the Sixteenth Institute, and in particular for uh, Samantha Court, whom we celebrate this evening, and uh, continue to bless her that she might do so much good for you by touching others with with your message and poetry. We give you thanks for these and all these uh, all the blessings you give to us through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, Samantha, do you want us, I want you to just have a chance to kind of meet the Archbishop here. Uh, do you want to, uh, say a few words to him about what the Teen Writing Fellowship means to you? Sure. Um, to me, the Teen Writer, um, Fellowship was, it was a really blessing experience. I was able to be around young Catholic writers who had the same ideals that I had and who had the same morals that I had. And it's really special to be able to share such a, something like writing, which I really love with Catholics who are around me. It was a really special experience. Um, well, thank you, Samantha. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna return to you. Archbishop Cordelione, unfortunately, uh, well, I know he's got a lot on, on his plate right now. So I want to say thank you, um, and as always, and let you go. So we'll move on with the rest of the program. I just want to add in front of everyone, my words of thanks and congratulations to Samantha. This is so encouraging to us in a time when humanities in general is on the decline and there's a growing lack of appreciation for how important the humanities are, and especially writing, and I would say in particular, poetry. Um, with this overly pragmatic attitude people have, they see higher education as sort of a uh, a high-end uh, vocational school, right? They don't understand that education means not just, just imparting knowledge. It's not about job skills. It's about opening a mind to discover the universe and forming a soul. We need the humanities for that. And poetry captures that in a way that no other form of literature or any other form of art can. So to see young people such as yourself, Samantha, who understand that and have extraordinary talent and, and apply it for uh, for the glory of God. And so people might be touched by his love and, and live better lives is it's really encouraging for us in this older generation. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Okay, so I have to drop off we love now. You, Archbishop. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye -bye. So that was recorded, Samantha. So you can you can play that again sometime if you want. And you're a little bit down and want a little encouragement. Um, I'd like to start. I hope most of you saw the story, the National Catholic Register. I was, register. I was so happy to see uh, published a story called uh, "A Texas-Sized Catholic Renaissance: um, Bringing a New Catholic Culture to Houston." I just botched the subtitle, but. Um, and it just occurred to me that we have so many of the people in that story here. We're going to, to give you the flow of the evening. We're going to start with a conversation with James Matthew Wilson, who, in addition to being our poet in residence and the judge of this contest uh, and uh, the future of Catholic letters in America as a scholar and a poet, uh, is also the co-founder of the new... University of Houston, University of St. Thomas, University of Thomas, St. Thomas at Houston, uh, Creative Writing MFA, Catholic Creating Writing MFA, which is unlike anything else in the country where uh, all, of, all of the arts programs, but creative writing programs are being repurposed from the deep purposes of literature and art to a monomaniacal lens on boring repetition of social justice means in every piece of work. That's just my opinion, but uh, I think there's something to it because uh, when James opened this up, he um, he, he and Joshua Horan of Wise Blood Books just found a massive outpouring of interest in that. So let, let me start, we're gonna, we're gonna talk to James Sarah is, was here, she had to go, so hopefully she'll come back, the founder of Catholic Literary Arts and the sponsor of this poetry contest we're celebrating the winner of. And then we're really pleased uh, to be joined by Dr. Uh, Debbie Haney, who is the su superintendent of schools in the Archdiocese of Houston. She will introduce our two poets formally, um, And uh, but I'm going to first dragoon her into telling us a little more about what the Archdiocese is doing, because I didn't really, I wasn't really aware uh, until I learned that Samantha Court was the Poet Laureate of, uh, oops, I got a let in, was the Poet Laureate of the Houston Archdiocese. I'm like, wow, Houston has a Poet Laureate, the Archdiocese has a Poet Laureate. That's, that's, that's pretty cool. So, um, James, why don't you start uh, by telling us what 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 is your perception of what's happening in Houston now in terms of Catholic culture? And are you surprised that it's happening in Houston? <laughs> so first of all, good evening, everybody. And uh, congratulations, Samantha. It's great to be here with you uh, tonight and to see you again. Um, and great, I'm so grateful that everybody joined us tonight for this celebration. Uh, Am I surprised that things are happening in Houston? I most certainly am. When um, it's it's hard to know where to begin, especially because I don't like to repeat myself endlessly. But um, but I will have to say something again that I've said multiple times before, and that is uh, three years ago when Joshua Wren and I uh, decided to start this Master of Fine Arts program, which really meant Joshua asked if I would be willing to go along with this plan. And I said yes, because I did not expect it to ever happen. So there was no harm in saying yes, because that's like saying, um, yeah, if you win the lottery, I'll I'll go to you know Hawaii with you. It was yes. Uh, so we we didn't expect, I did not expect anything to come of his scheming over a dinner at Sarah Cortez house in Houston. I merely said yes to be polite and because up until that point he had been my publisher so I felt an obligation to say yes and uh but suddenly the University of St. Thomas which I had known very well for decades because of their Center for Thomistic Studies one of the leading places in the world to study uh the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas um I had always admired that university but I never expected to have anything to do with it and then suddenly 
over the course of just a few weeks, Joshua and I were beginning a Master of Fine Arts program that would be the first and only such program in the world that would have a thoroughly Catholic curriculum. And I uh, have always been a partisan of lost causes. And so my siding with this, I assumed was gonna be no exception. Uh, and so I expected things not to work out and to fail, but I thought, well, we'll try it. And before I knew it, we had more than filled up our first annual class. And we're now, we've just begun our third academic year and we're in three years of completely full courses, each cohort, I hate that word, but each cohort, each annual class, entering class has been completely full and in fact, overflowing with students. And the reason for that is, is actually not very deeply mysterious. We're a writing program that actually loves literature. We're a writing program that thinks that an encounter with beauty is an epiphany. It's an encounter with the unveiling of reality. And people who like books, people who love the arts, know that that's what the arts are really about. They are not about somebody's ideological or political program. Um, uh, you know, a friend of mine is a, a trumpet player with the Baltimore Symphony, and his poor um, symphony at one point decided to raise, get canned canned goods for the homeless, which was great, but uh, <laughs> but it was probably not uh, the essential mission of an orchestra. Uh, so our program is committed to that central and absolutely essential purpose of the arts, which is to train writers to make beautiful things. Um, and uh, when we began the program, I vowed that we would, um, excuse me, I vowed that we would uh, not just create another graduate program, but that we would do something that would reach every Catholic in the United States, and that would be 11 for the entire culture. And so we had hoped to start the program and soon enough to start a center uh, that would become a sort of institutional hub that would lead to different programs that would reach everyone in the world. At least, well, at least as many people in the world as we possibly could. Every age in the world. We wanted to have programs for young people. We wanted to have programs for people who were otherwise occupied, but just wanted to deepen their appreciation of literature a little bit more or to get some experience with writing. And then of course the MFA program uh, itself has reached people both worldwide. We've had students in uh, Dublin and and uh, Tel Aviv, and uh, and even strange places like Houston, um, and we uh, and we have reached every age group. Our first in our first graduating class, we had Father Phil Flott, a retired priest uh, in a Nebraska diocese, and he completed the program at age seventy nine, and of course is flourishing and publishing poems left and right in different different magazines. We also had a cloistered Benedictine monk who lives out in a monastery in the desert outside Santa Fe. And because of the unique structure of our program where we're mostly though not exclusively online, he was able to complete this graduate program with us even though he is living out his uh, monastic vows in that monastery. So we've been able to reach a lot of people, but we wanted to reach more than any one graduate program could. And so I had sketched out our long-term plan uh, for reaching especially the young. And I want to say more about that later tonight if we have a chance. Um, and as I was sketching out what I, what I was hoping we would do at the University of St. Thomas, I realized that someone else was already doing. And it was someone, the first person I had invited to be on our visiting faculty and it was also one of the people who, even though she was on the visiting faculty, applied to become a student in the same program where she served in the faculty. And that was none other than Sarah Cortez. And when I contemplated what Sarah was doing at Catholic Literary Arts in Houston, I realized that she was already doing many of the things that I had hoped in the long term we might be able to start doing. And so thanks be to God, we've been able to partner with Sarah and through her initiative and the great 
fearless Catholic writers camps, the high school writers institute, and the other kinds of workshops and short courses that Catholic Literary Arts is running from and in Houston, though many of them are online. Um, she has been able to already um, have help us fulfill our goal of reaching Catholics at every age and across the, the country. And so it's just been a delight to have her associated with the program. It was from the very beginning, of course it was, because she's a very dear person, but it was also a great delight to realize that just by partnering with her, she had already done so much of the legwork to make this great dream come true. And so we're just thrilled for that. And it was my great honor this summer um, as part of cementing this, this partnership that we could host her programming at the University of St. Thomas. And then I was able to come and spend three days with the students in the program, lecturing to them, something I'm planning to do uh, next year as well. So I'm gonna turn things back Wonderful. over to Peggy. That, that... Oh, that, I, I, that should cue me up to go to Sarah, except that you said one thing and I'd like you to branch out for us a little more. When you say it's uh, deeply Catholic, some word like that you use. And now, first of all, all the students aren't Catholics. Many, they're, they're mostly people of faith, mm -hmm. uh, but the program itself is deeply Catholic. So a deep grounding. What does that mean? Flesh out a little, a little more what, I'm, I'm what you try to, to give these to, students. Yes, that's that's a great question. Uh, and I'm, I take a lot of pleasure in answering it. So let me let me do it by way, way of contrast. Um, if you were to apply to the typical Master of Fine Arts program, pretty much anywhere in the country, you would go with a cohort of writers and you would take a workshop once a week where you critiqued each other's work. And then you would be sort of pawned off to the PhD faculty of the English department of that university to take, um, you know, to take these very arcane scholarly courses with the doctoral students on things like um, women and property in 17th century English literature, you know, something obscure, not quite underwater basket weaving, uh, because in fact, maybe less worthwhile than underwater basket weaving, because at least at the end of underwater basket weaving, you can weave a basket basket weaving in water. Um, but so we don't do that. And it, it, there's no point in that because a writer doesn't care about that stuff. A writer wants to make a beautiful work of art, make a story that's compelling to people, learn how to write a line of verse to just do good work, as Jacques Maritain always said. So what we did was constructed a 10 course curriculum that out of the very heart of the church would form, not simply inform as in impart knowledge, but do a full intellectual and spiritual formation with our students so that they know how to think out of the heart of the church, not merely uh, obediently, but with the profound metaphysical imagination that the church and its long tradition and its great history of, of intellectual reflection has to offer. And so our 10 courses are, are, I always say that our peer programs are not other MFA programs. They're places like the John Paul II Institute in Washington, DC, or, or the Thomistic Studies Institute at the University of St. Thomas, because our students go away or receive in our program a complete core education in, for instance, the the philosophy and theology of the Catholic Church as it pertains to beauty and the arts. Um, they they study the great works of the Catholic uh, revival in the United States and in Europe. And they also go way back to ancient literature. Every student in our program is going to study over the course of a semester, um, uh, Virgil, St. Augustine, and Dante. And so cu that coupled with studying Plato and Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas and Benedict XVI, they're actually going to be fully equipped both to teach uh, and to share with the world this great tradition in myriad kinds of ways, but they're also going to be formed in such a way that this vast, truly cosmic, <laughs> This vast tradition is shaping how they look at the practice of art 
and and how they look at the practices uh, of of their craft. So, um, and so, so there's there's so much more to say beyond that. I'm struggling to to figure out what I want to say next. But I'll say I'll say one thing, um, or well, two things. The way we formed the curriculum was simply asking, what does every writer who wants to be serious need to know? And there's an answer to that. It doesn't take long to come up with the answer. And that's what our curriculum was built on. And one other aspect, and this is the last thing I'll share before turning things back over to you, is um, is is uh, every one of those courses is designed to make the student a better writer. So let me give you a quick example. I'm teaching our philosophy of art and beauty seminar right now. And all those students are gonna be reading Plato, Aristotle, Sir Philip Sidney, Thomas Aquinas, Hansers von Balthasar, and they're going to be engaging those philosophical, theological, and literary critical texts. They're going to be writing about them, but they're not going to just write, they're not going to write some arcane scholarly paper that will only be of interest to five people. We throw down the gauntlet with our students so that everything they read in our curriculum, they're challenged to write essays and reviews that would introduce these works to a lay audience because we what we need our students to do is not only to write the next great poem the next great short story or novel we need them also to prepare a climate of opinion people's interests in what they read and their ability to receive good books is conditioned in part by uh, having their own critical sensibilities opened to these things and so our students are being trained to be both, um, or be formed, I should say, to be both original creative artists, but also great interpreters of literature to the church and to the world. Um, I, I think that that is such, so oh, yeah. essential for our work because um, we live in, it, as, as the archbishop sort of indicated, we live in an age of decline and increasing illiteracy, but people still have souls and they can't get rid of them no matter what they try to do. And so we have to find ways to open up those souls to the kind of profound reality that literature can communicate. But we we have to we have to find the key for those souls to even give to free of them to even give these great works of art a chance and to be to be moved by them. And so we want our students to be well, doing well, well. not just a few things well. We want them to be doing many things well for the sake of the culture. Well, one of the things um, that I'm struck by, you know, you you in the National Catholic Register, you it relate, I think, from a speech you gave that uh, the significance of Dana Joya's The Catholic Writer Today uh, in your work. And Sarah had the same experience. And I had a slightly different experience because for me, it was a kind of meeting of my small mind with his great mind because I had been going around and asking. I started getting interested in this. I was like, I, with everyone I, I met who is Catholic, I would say, who's the greatest living Catholic novelist? Mm -hmm. And the great truth is only one of about 200 people I asked could e even name a living Catholic artist, right? And um, so it seems to me that one of the things you're doing in this educational process is building or recovering a modern English speaking Catholic canon of literature. Mm -hmm. Is that something you would agree on? I mean I, I, I would. Uh it's the the canon's not the first term I would think. Um what it's it's building the 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 phrase I always use and I and forgive me for stealing a great line from W.H. Auden and then using it so often that I, it's almost as if I'm making pretenses that it's mine. But Auden, uh, in his um, his poem on Sigmund Freud, he said that Sigmund Freud formed a whole climate of opinion, which if you look at America in the 1950s, you can say that again. Um, I love that phrase, climate of opinion. Um, one of the great challenges of the church in our day is that a kind of reductive materialism is not something anybody studied in school. Very few students are reading Rene Descartes or Thomas Hobbes or John Locke. It's in the air they breathe. It's in the air we breathe. And so we need new oxygen. <laughs> and so, uh, so changing the climate, uh, it's not so much about, sorry, 
it's not primarily about just rebuilding up the canon. It's creating a place where a canon is even a meaningful thing in the first place. And then, then we'll talk about the canon. This is a digression, and I'm going to get to Sarah in 30 seconds. But I just discovered a really interesting novel by a French Catholic I'd never heard of. Uh, oh, she's a woman named Laurence Cosse. Are you familiar with her work by chance? You're sending me information about it the other day was the first I'd ever heard of her. But, you know, I have she stacks just, behind I, me. I, I, got, I got this novel, Corner of the Veil. It's premised on the fact that an actual proof of the existence of God, which is irrefutable, is discovered. And we don't, of course, hear that proof, but it's the impact on the world of the church of what happens if God's existence were actually proved, which I just think is such a fascinating premise. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of what I love about this Catholic lens is there's a lot of really interesting work out there that's been overlooked, right? And um, there's a lot of jewels to be discovered and recovered and we appreciate what you're doing so much. Uh, Sarah, I don't know if you were on when he gave you that incredible shout out for he had dreamed that one day he might do a bunch of stuff with young people. And then he discovered you were already doing it. Are you here? Yes, Sarah? You actually, say hi? I've actually heard uh, James say that in person. So, um, yeah, I've been here, I, you know, with the, the the abundance of attendees. I might not be in the screen that you can see, Maggie, but uh you know, it's wonderful to work in an environment uh, that's um, not comp not competitive. And by environment, I'm sort of talking about the strategic, I'm going to use a corporate term here, the strategic partnerships uh, that uh, CLA and myself and James and Benedict 16 and you, Maggie, uh, University of St. Thomas, uh, Houston Christian University and this magnificent archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, represented tonight by Dr. Haney. You know the and and I'm sure there are other institutions I'm not mentioning. So forgive me if if any of you belong to one of them. But uh, there's no way I I I don't believe. I mean, when I was younger, I thought I could do everything myself, and I thought I was you know all the things you think when you're 21 and. 31 and so forth. But, you know, the Holy Spirit, um, my understanding is, you know, we are built for relationship, not only with God, but with other people, even when other people, whether other people are magnificent or um, the opposite. And so uh, it's just such a pleasure for me, uh, not only to work with with other organizations, other phenomenally uh, visionary people. Uh, I, I see so many faces here that I could name uh, each with their own, uh, you know, incredibly um, magnificent visions for what can be reached, whether it's with younger people, teens, elementary, adults, um, so, I know Sarah, when I, why don't you, why don't, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just, I wanted to, to, maybe you could tell us, you know, but we don't all know. So tell us about what Catholic literary arts does. And in particular about the programming that led to this teen writing fellowship that we're going to hear a poetry reading from tonight. Sure. And and I'm I'm looking forward also to hearing so much. Uh, uh, I do want to say Maria Jesco showed up. Our honorable mention uh, has yes, showed I, up. I, yes, and, yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, our mission statement is to guide, train, educate, and mentor Catholic writers of all ages. All of our programming is open to all people of goodwill, and we. Uh, go forward in our mission with both virtual and in-person um, classes. We also have uh, a very uh, thriving uh, critique group. I think we have five right now, uh, critique groups that uh, being a CLA member opens you up to joining. Uh, and then we have this really robust uh, youth, uh, series of youth programs 
you asked that I speak in particular about the uh, the the teen ridership program. So I thought of this program as a way to to begin instituting on a more formal basis the the career steps that one needs to have, or most people, maybe one doesn't need to have them, but they help with a writing career. And um, just a little bit of personal information. I was raised Catholic, but I was away from the Catholic church for many, many years. And most of my literary career, most of my books were published during that time. And I worked for several publishing houses, um, and re regional boards and statewide uh, organizations and so forth, literary organizations. And so I got to observe what the quote unquote typical career paths are for writers. And when I looked at writers of faith, of course, I was back in the Catholic church, I realized that that industry knowledge was not widespread, particularly among writers of faith. So we Catholic, Literary arts exist to be a home for writers and help with all these situations. That's wonderful. I, it's a, it's. A, I'm tickled to watch everything uh, unfold with you and for you, Sarah. Because in part because you will remember, I first met you when the art right. We just have just launched the Benedict or relaunched the Benedict Sixteen. I had come on board, and the Archbishop. I sent him on a little media tour and he uh, was, I believe it was a Catholic Answers radio program. And afterwards he said, there's this, this poet, she wants to start something for poets. Can you contact her? And she had, she had called in and asked him what, uh, for advice. And he, of course, at probably having no theory about how you found a writing fellowship program, gave you very good advice and said, make sure you have a chaplain. <laughs> mm -hmm. So as I recall, so it's been a wonderful friendship since then. And just wonderful to watch all one very busy and tired lady can accomplish in a second blooming uh, late in life. Um, speaking of which I give a shout out to Roseanne T. Sullivan, who is the writer of the National Catholic Register piece and our Facebook editor. And uh, Dana just sent me an email saying that she is the de facto historian of the new Catholic revival. So Roseanne, we always love it when you come. Um, let me uh, invite Dr. Haney on, because I know, I know James and I know Sarah, I'm just thrilled to get to know Dr. Haney. Can you say hello, Dr. Haney, so you pop up on our speaker screen here? Sure. Good evening. My name is Dr. Debbie Haney. I'm the superintendent, secretary, director, and superintendent of Catholic schools for the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. And I'm very honored and pleased to be with you. Well, we're going to call on you to introduce our teen writing fellow, Samantha Court, and our honorable mention, Maria Jesco, in just a few minutes. But first, can you tell me a little bit about what's happening in the arts in the Archdiocese of Houston that you're aware of? I can tell you what's happening in the Catholic schools um, for sure. Okay. And so um, I know that we're very grateful to Sarah Cortez and her work um, with kind of started at one of our elementary schools, St. Francis de Sales in Houston. And we had a poetry contest there and a good friend of Sarah's uh, invited her to be a judge. And then things just kind of blossomed um, and it's become a really great event for all of our students to participate in. Um, and we're very honored to be partnering with Sarah in the poetry contest. Um, in addition to poetry, we also have, um, we work with the Scanlon Foundation, which many people are probably familiar with on this call. Um, Scanlon um, is an organization that supports all things Catholic in the state of Texas, and especially in our archdiocese, we're very grateful to them. We are currently in the process of working on extending what we do in the poetry contest to the arts and to music. And so Larry Massey and I are working on developing a plan for artists um, that are in the visual arts or in the musical arts, uh, performing arts to create something similar to the poetry contest um, so that we can have 
kind of a revival of Catholic sacred art and music in our archdiocese and really highlight the beautiful talents of the students that we have in our schools. So that's kind of what's that happening. It's just very exciting. You know, I was, I went down, Larry Massey brought, brought me down and Sarah actually took me all around. And one of the places was to the, the co-cathedral and where I met with the music director. And my understanding is that in the archdiocese, things like Gregorian chant workshops are run through the diocese. And I don't know if any of that has trickled down into the schools or not. Um, is that one of the things you're working on? There have there have been a couple of schools that have embraced Gregorian chant. Um, the students on this on the poetry winners tonight can also talk about that at St. Teresa's Catholic School. It's one of our classical schools, and they certainly do um, embrace Gregorian chant. We have another classical school in our diocese that does the same. And our art, our music teachers have been also learning from the music director at the Co-Cathedral. Um, she's been doing some in-services for our teachers to expose them to all types of sacred music. So certainly chant is one of those. So we'll, I, I have a feeling we'll see it uh, come up in other schools as well, just as a form of praise to God and a beautiful way to worship him. Yeah, and it, 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 the truth is, see, this is something that the Archbishop has really pointed out to me, uh, in which I've seen uh, when I've attended some of these workshops. If our, we, we have a theory that children should be singing, we should have children's choir, and they should sing childish music. And what happens is when the kid turns around seven or eight or nine at the oldest, they're like, I don't want to do that anymore. That's baby stuff, right? It's sort of almost imprints the idea that 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 the liturgy is is for young children and um whereas uh if kids as young as five or six learn gregorian chants they're learning first of all they're very good at picking it up because it's a language essentially and the younger you start languages the easier it is to do but secondly they're doing something adult and grown up and so and it's it's kind of beautiful to watch there are, but anyway, I uh, look forward to hearing more about what Houston is accomplishing in the arts. And thank you for joining us, Dr. Amy. Sure. And um, I will add, I will add to that that um, there are some Gregorian chant workshops being hosted by the Archdiocese. They talk about it on Catholic Radio show that um, we have in Houston. And so there are adult classes also as part of the offerings at the Archdiocese, and those have been extremely well attended. So it's it's making a comeback uh, right now in Houston for sure. Well, that's so wonderful. Um, and the schools are doing well. They are. We've seen an increase in enrollment, uh, which is good news for Catholic education. And we have almost eighteen thousand students in our schools this year. We opened a new school, a new high school for career and technical education, as an offering to the students in our diocese. We have. 11 other high schools that are all college preparatory, um, but this kind of fills a niche of need within our diocese. So we're, we're thrilled to have St. Peter's Catholic High School opening this year. So it's, it's been good things happening. Well, congratulations. I, I'd like to invite the audience if you have any questions. Roseanne, I see that you asked, can people name Catholic artists now? And I, I don't know, because I haven't really been going, I stopped going around asking people that, but, um, uh, I, I think I think there's more work to do. Uh, the the one thing I will say is that the Benedict XVI operates on a theory of culture, uh, which I learned partly in the '90s from David Blankenhorn when I was working on the problem of fatherless America and marriage, and partly from my years when I was fighting gay marriage, and I just watched how the um, LGBT community sort of did what they do. Um, and I, 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 my sense is that the most significant thing that we have done is shown that we can raise the profile of an extremely gifted Catholic composer, Frank LaRocca. First, see, and this is the key, first within the Catholic community, we have to value our own artists and care about them. And I like to say, if we can't pay anything else, we can pay attention. Um, 
And now we're beginning to see uh, the loop back of, you know, like just the, the theory that you can, you can commission great art again from the bosom of the church. It can find audiences by moving through the cathedrals before winning the respect of secular arts elites and ending up in, you know, at the Lincoln Center. And that's the kind of process that we're seeing happen. And it starts first with Catholics valuing our own artists because no one else is going to do it if, 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 if we don't care. And it's very hard. I, when I was in college, I debated a topic, the true artist needs no audience. And that's about the falsest thing. I, I can't remember what side I took then, but the, the, the you know, the, the, uh, everyone works better in community. And as Dana Joya told James Matthew Wilson, you shouldn't have to do this alone. So all of you in the audience here, it's like what they say in AAA, just by showing up here, you are in fact playing an important role in sparking a new resonance because you're showing that people care about this. And that's one of the things our, our artists really need. Um, so uh, Dr. Haney, do you wanna, I think we'll just introduce you introduce both of the poets and we'll bring them in and talk to them for a little bit and then end with the poetry reading. Um, sure. So, sure. Do you want and to, I'll, go ahead. I'll add one more thing. The Scanlon Foundation is also having a Sacred Art Live um, opportunities and they open up the seminary uh, center and they have sacred artists come and display their work and people can come and appreciate that and purchase it. And it has sold out the last two years. So there is definitely some action going on in that area. So great news. So anyway, without further ado, I am very excited to introduce our two, po our two poets tonight. So I'm gonna start with Maria Jesko. Maria graduated from St. Teresa's Catholic School in 2022, and she won the 2022 Poet Laureate Award for the Archdiocesan Sacred Poetry Contest, sponsored by Catholic Literary Arts. She is currently a sophomore at Kempner High School in Sugarland, Texas. Last year, she won two gold keys and one silver key in the National Scholastic Art and Writing Contest. Maria is a second year varsity member of the water polo and swim teams. In addition, she is currently the student director and vice president of her school choir. Maria's portfolio was chosen as the honorable mention in the Benedict XVI Teen Writing Fellow Competition. That is an impressive list of activities and accolades for a sophomore in high school. Maria, we're very proud of you. Thank you. Maria, can you, there you go. I wanted you to say a few words so we can see you. Welcome, sure. Maria. Hi, I'm sorry, your, your video cut out for a second. Could you repeat that? We just wanted you to say hello. So after that nice introduction, they see your face and they know who's been introduced. So welcome. Right. Thank you for coming and thank you for the gift of your talent. Wonderful. And now we'll introduce uh, Samantha, Samantha Court and then we'll bring you in conversation. So Samantha is a first prize winner of the 2023 Catholic Citizenship Essay Contest at the state and international levels and in 2022 on the council, district, and state levels. Samantha was chosen as the current Poet Laureate for the Catholic Literary Arts 2023 Archdiocesan Poetry Contest as an eighth grader, and she has received many other accolades throughout her young writing career. She was also recently awarded the Youth of the Year Award for her services at the St. Teresa Parish Community and the Knights of Columbus St. Basil Council 4204. Samantha's portfolio was chosen as the winner in the Benedict the 16th Teen Writing Fellow Competition. So please join me in congratulating and welcoming these two incredible writers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, say some more there, Samantha, so we see you again. We did meet you earlier, but Thank you so much. <laughs> well, let me start with you, Samantha. Um, and James and Sarah, jump in if you feel inspired. Um, tell me a little bit about your, um, how you came to be a poet. What is the relationship between your life, your faith, and your art? So it really started with my writing. 
I, when I was younger, I wrote a lot of stories and, you know, short stories and all that. And I believe my love of poetry is kind of a mix of my love of writing and my love of music because I really love music. I love playing piano. I love singing. I love, I love lyrical things, um, words that create beautiful patterns. And when I was in sixth grade, we started really looking into poetry. And I thought it was really fascinating because it took two things of my life and it kind of melded it all together. And so that's kind of where I developed my love of poetry. Um, so what poetry did you begin reading that inspired you to, to begin with? Um, we began, when we began reading sonnets, that was my favorite type of poetry that really inspired me. It was structured, but it also flowed. And I really liked that. Um, we also read a lot of uh, Catholic and religious poems about our faith. And it was really interesting to see how people are able to impact others with um, poems. So what, uh, so name for me a few of the sonnets or the poets who write sonnets that you love. Um, I really love Shakespeare. Um, I really love, he has all the archaic terms and it's really interesting. Um, and I just really love poetry a lot. Now you started a reading sonnets. Is that, are you in the classical liberal school in that uh, Dr. Haney was describing? Are you homeschooled? When did you 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 started reading sonnets younger than we are generally expect young people to? I graduated from Saint Teresa's, so yes, I was. It's a classical school. Uh, I'm going to jump in yeah. and just mention that Dr. Samuel Klumpenhauer, who uh, is become our contact. The last two CLA sponsored Archdiocesan Poet Laureates have come out of his classes. He's uh, with us tonight. Oh, well, wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. I I, uh, uh, I don't know if you want to jump in and say a few words about Samantha. I don't know if Maria is your student too, or is it just Samantha? I, yeah, okay. Ma Maria. Wanna so jump in? Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. So I, so I teach grade eight here at St. Teresa Catholic School. And yes, yeah, so Maria was a student of mine and Samantha was a student of mine. And um, as uh, there's uh, many good teachers here, I, so I'm not going to claim any kind of uh, soul credit. Mr. George, especially in grade six, is always uh, he's there. He was both of uh, for Samantha. I forget if he was for Maria. But in any case, he he uh, does a wonderful job introducing them to to poetry in a very in a very lively sense. They do a fair amount of research poems even there. Um, uh, by the time they get to me, we we read a fair amount of sonnets. Uh, we do read Dante as well. Uh, so the, the kids have been exposed to uh, Norma de Purgatorio. And indeed, for the poetry contest, I believe when Maria submitted her poems, it was uh, we did sonnets that year. Typically, I find it's better to give the students some kind of structure um, because it's, it, it just it's what kids need. They need routine and structure in order to flourish. And uh, in Samantha's year, we we submitted, um, we actually adopted Dante's uh, meter, uh, Terza Rima, and they submitted it in, in that form as well. Uh, but it's always uh, joyful as a teacher to have uh, such lively students who, who enjoy learning. And um, again, I, I miss these girls. They were great students. Oh, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate your being here. Maria, do you want to come and tell us a little bit about your uh, development as an artist and as a Catholic? Um, sure. I think um, my love of just literature in general came from a really young age. I've always just been a big reader. And then, um, like Dr. Oops, you're fading. Is there anyone else having trouble hearing her? Try again. Uh, no, we Dr. can't Klumpenhauer hear you said a in lot. Sixth grade, we, especially in sixth grade, we started to. Huh. We just heard you briefly and now you're very frustrating. I don't know if there's something you can do with the internet on your end. Um, Is it working Don't now? 
Yes, it is working now. Go ahead and continue. You were starting to tell us. Okay. Yes, well, in sixth grade, we particularly dive deep into poetry, and one of my favorites was... Maria, it's so disappointing to me, but you you cut out again. We 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 can't hear you. I don't know if I could if there's someone if there's another place in your house or somewhere you could go, because I'd really like to hear be able to hear you read your poem. All right, well we'll just we'll we'll try we'll try to come back to you again and see if we can hear and if the internet. Uh, uh, we begin God, the year with the prayer. epic poem of Lepanto by G.K. Chesterton. I'll try. That's so funny. We're just getting little little bits. All right. Well, we appreciate you. It was a lovely sonnet that you wrote. And uh, I remember James Matthew Wilson saying that he was reading through the work that was submitted. And he said, I came across this perfect devotional sonnet by a 15-year-old or 14-year-old. I don't remember the age. But anyway, um, so... Uh, uh, there's a woman named Ariel who would like to add some praise, and maybe we'll do this before moving on to hearing the poetry. Oh, there's a suggestion that you dial in on the, uh, we're, we're seeing you, you might want to turn off your video because you're looking kind of distressed there, Maria. <laughs> Probably everyone doesn't need that. Oh, you don't want everyone to see it. Um, and yeah, so the other, if you have the uh, information, you could phone in and we could hear you that way that sometimes works. so give that a try um so ariel did you want to say a few yes. words on meet yourself yes so we traded emails today because i talked to couple myself tom schuster at epiphany catholic school where my daughter went to and i'm looking forward to meeting you there uh, I want to remind everybody here that uh, some 1700 years ago Somebody by the name of uh, San Augustine uh, say that to sing is to pray twice. And I don't know if it's because of my uh, pre-K through high school Jesuit education, but somewhere in middle school, I was given the very hard task of uh, uh, reading and writing an essay about the city of God. So that sort of stuck with me. But the other thing that I'd like to share with you Besides the music part, is the overall artistic part of, of, of a human soul. And uh, something that I read some time ago, I don't remember who he was in some biography or some artist, maybe from the Renaissance. But uh, what I understand as art is the ultimate affirmation of life is that we are alive. And just like the corporal body needs nourishment, the soul needs prayer and religion. So I want to praise you for what you're doing here because uh, it's something that uh, in, in, in Spanish, uh, I speak Spanish, uh, there is a saying that no solo de pan vive el hombre, which means that uh, beyond nourishment with food, you have to nourish your soul. And what you're doing here is exactly that. I want to thank you for that. Oh, well, God bless you. That's so kind of you. And we appreciate your coming. And it sounds very similar to what James Matthew Wilson was telling us too, that uh, it was wonderful to hear from you. Um, Samantha, would you like to step forward and share with us? We've been talking about art and the importance of beauty and the importance of craft. And now we get to the most important part where our Benedict 16 teen writing fellow is going to share with us four poems. So if you would give us the title of the poem and say anything you wanna say about it and then recite it, we would just love to hear it. Sure, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, my, my first poem that I will be reading is called Litany for Light. And it is more of a prayer and a litany than a poem. And it is asking God to help us to appreciate the beauty of the earth, which we as humans so frequently um, abuse. Litany for Light. In time of desperation, hear my prayer. O Lord, who sits among the hallowed hum of angels' wings that beat and clap and drum. 
O Lord, hear fast this litany of despair. A world you made for us to keep and care, a world of wonder, beauty shining bright. But human hands have darkened it as night and took much more than what was our fair share. O Lord, come lift us from our evil plight, young souls that turn from you to a worldly loot, replacing Eden's fruit with smoke and soot, from belching factories limiting our sight. For Lord, O Lord, our gaze, it has been turned from you to things of dust, to things of dirt, to wonderful at first, then mortal hurt, Teach us the hallowed lesson to be learned and open up our eyes that we may see your face of love that watches painfully. Wow. And then, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, okay. My next, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, my next poem is actually a Shakespearean sonnet that I wrote in sixth grade. So it's actually kind of appropriate since Dr. Copeland Howard bought it, Mr. George, my sixth grade teacher. And um, it's really special to me because it's the first uh, sonnet that I ever wrote. It's called Faith. Um, when sundown's fallen on each rolling wave and sits atop a glistening mount of foam, then there is hope. I know I shall be saved from gaping darkness, once my only home. And if I choose to jump from spires tall or face a stone that blocks the only road, the angel's wings will break the spinning fall. The hand of God will lift the heavy load. And if the darkness swallows up my heart and I have but a wick bent on its knee. I know that he and I are not apart, and he will light my wick so I may see God's glory, angels singing, hands to lyre, and set my heart on ever-burning fire. Thank you. I just should say that chat, look at the chat box before you go, because it's full of praise for you and appreciation. Much. Um, thank you <laughs> no please go on um my next poem is actually about a real experience i had and praying in adoration once at a spiritual retreat i went to in seventh grade it's called adoration if every candle burned that night the light would never match that of the hallowed monstrance set alight with heavenly fire and burning love. And in the golden sun of rays, our Lord looked back as white as snow, a pure and loving suffering face in form of bread and brittle host. Upon my knees, I knelt in prayer. The room was hushed, all noise was dead. A quiet whisper filled the air and echoing within my head. The word of God had come that night. My soul, an empty cup, was filled. My heart burned like the monstrance bright. My thoughts grew hushed. My words were stilled. For even he had touched my heart, who sits amidst the eternal hum of angels' wings, close then apart, that beat and march and sing and drum. And when I left that faithful night, my hope restored, my being filled. This crazy world was less a fright, for I had felt what he had willed. Well, Samantha, um, Mina, I saw your comment on how touching these were, and I just wanted to introduce you. Mina, uh, Essary, who just got married, so I believe her last name is Pousseau, is a young woman composer, not as young as you are. Um, but uh, she, we, we met her at the Sir James Macmillan uh, Young Composers Institute that we did. 
and um, two extremely gifted musicians mentioned that of all, just singled her out. And we, we've actually commissioned a new work from her, which is setting one of the poems of Roseanne T. Sullivan to um, a, new, a new Christmas or Advent hymn that we'll be using in our December 10th, if you're in San Francisco, um, our St. Nicholas Day uh, uh, prayer service is turning into a, a very Marian Advent service. So, um, Mina, if you don't mind, you want to come and say hello to Samantha? I feel like um, it's uh, it would be great for her to know you. Congratulations to both of you, Samantha. Your your poems are really stunning, stunningly beautiful, and I'm very touched. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie, for Thanks. the shout out. Thanks, Mina. Um, Samantha, we our final poem. Okay. Um, my final poem is actually the poem I won Poet Laureate with. It is called Amor in Omnis, which is Latin for love in this dream. And I was inspired by the Luminous Mysteries. And this poem is about a man who witnessed the baptism of Jesus in Jordan and is telling his son the story. The lamp lit up the room with light as father sat by son and said, I'll tell a tale for you tonight. The reeds sprung from the riverbed, the sky was bright, the sun shone high, and John the Baptist there had tread. We'd crowd around and we would try to hear his words that shine and gleam, like rivers dance through deserts dry. And Jordan was that bubbling stream where he'd bring those to be baptized and come out cleansed as in a dream. But what we had not realized, dear boy, I hope that you'll believe, a higher one had exercised his love in form of man who'd leave but not before there came the day when love incarnate did achieve as dipped beneath the waves of gray and skies threw open wings glowed bright to open clouded eyes that day. Thank you, Samantha. Thanks to everyone who commented in, in the chat room as well. Um, we're going to give another try for Maria, who I think has moved and we're going to we're just, uh, Roseanne is sending up prayers and I hope you are too, that we'll get a chance to hear her in person. Um, I wanted to take a minute and introduce my my finest colleague, my right-hand man, uh, one of the finest young Catholic family men and creative minds I know. Kevin, I saw you're on. Do you wanna say hello so everyone can know who you are? Kevin Kakvinsky, who is our director. Hello everyone. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet His you. His whole family has COVID, so, you know, he could use a few prayers, too. Um, I probably shouldn't say these things in, in, in public. Sorry, Kevin. Thanks for putting up with me. Maria, you want to say hello? And are we able to hear you? Let's give it a try. Oh dear, Kevin's face is still on the line, so it means. Well, I think we'll have to send around a, a poem or two in the next newsletter, which goes out to over 80,000 Catholics. And Maria, I hope that's, I'm very disappointed. I personally would have loved to hear this lovely sonnet. I've read it and it is magnificent, but um, stay in touch and keep writing. And thank you both, James and, do you want to have anything you want to say in as we close out the evening? Oh, I do. So I'm so glad we got to hear Samantha's poems. Um, and uh, that was just wonderful. And Maria's poem will be worth waiting for. So I hope that it gets shared with everybody. Um, they're both tremendously talented. And um, uh, it's Ford Maddox Ford who discovered... Uh, the writing of of D. H. Lawrence early in the twentieth century, he he concluded that he wanted to publish D. H. Lawrence's short stories after reading one sentence, 
He said, it only takes one line. And that was my experience this summer reading uh, first Maria's sonnet and then Samantha's work was it was instant. Uh, it was instantaneous to see that this was real. This was real poetry being done. Um, I'm grateful to their their teachers. I something I would have said earlier tonight, and I just want to say now is um, is people like me, a lot of us, our education in the arts has always been remedial. We have to go in search of the great things that have been done, but we have to do it belatedly. Uh, and it's so wonderful to see these two uh, young women growing up in an environment where the arts aren't something you go seek out in your early 20s or your 30s when you realize that there are genuine great treasures buried somewhere in the dust, but that they're simply growing up learning how to the practices of verse craft. That's how the great poets were trained. And just to give you one quick example, Alexander Pope was writing brilliant poems when he was 15, 16, 17. They weren't very profound. He was a callow young teenager, but they were they were perfectly crafted and they would be they would stand out in our day like great triumphs. And so it's so wonderful. Imagine if these two young poets are this good now, imagine how they're going to be once they've come into their maturity. And it's because they're growing up with a culture of verse craft in their classical schools and uh, and through events like this that give them an opportunity to share their work. So so thanks to Sarah, thanks to Maggie, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Yeah, Maggie, and I, you, so I would I like to help your audience sort of put the accomplishments of both of our young poets today in perspective. Uh, when CLA took over the Archdiocesan Sacred Poetry Contest, uh, Maria Jesko's poem won uh, out of over a thousand entries. And likewise for Samantha. So there's a lot of great young poets uh, writing in Houston. It's our privilege to honor them. And every single poet in the middle school, um, sixth, seventh, and eighth grades who placed in that contest, we give a free scholarship to the Fearless Catholic Writing Camp in June. And that's part of what James came and helped us with. We created a high school writers institute and I'd like to acknowledge uh, with great thankfulness and abundance, Leslie Clinton, who's one of uh, who's director of the high school writers institute and um, CLA board member and an amazing poet herself. Thank you so much, Leslie. I, I want before I close, I really wanted to give you, uh, Sarah, a chance to promote anything you're doing next that people could participate in, or should they just go to catholicliteraryarts.com and see the feast you lay out for the world? Please go to catholicliteraryarts.com, look at our adult offerings, look at our offerings, lesson plans for teaching creative writing and writer's retreats for entering into your vocation as a Catholic writer. We try to do it all. And if there's something that needs to be done that we're not doing, give me a holler. Uh, that Sarah, that's catholicliteraryarts.org. Um, dot org, not dot com. Sorry, that was my mistake. Uh, Maria, I see several people have given you a phone number. Do you, we can pause for a minute and see if you can call in and read us your sonnet, or you can tell me in the chat message box that that probably won't work for you. And uh, I, I have called in. Is it working now? Yes. Oh, how are you? we get to hear Maria Jesco's sonnet. Tell us what you're going to read for us. Um, I'm sorry. Did you want me to do the one from the Poet Laureate or the one from the Honorable Mention? Uh, why don't you read them both? Okay. Um, for the Honorable Mention, uh, my, it was like a question poem. Uh, it's called To Christ Crucified, and it's like I got the inspiration from seeing the crucifix in the classroom, and it was what I would, I suppose, think if I had been there. So, uh, To Christ Crucified. How can you not cry out against the nails? How can you love the cross that gives you death? How can you only shiver in the gales, unmoving, waiting for your final breath? 
Why love me after all I did to you? Why stay here and not call the angel host? Why give your life when I have been untrue, unmoving, waiting, you who love the most? What way can I alleviate your pain? What prayer to say to bring my sins to light? What water can my bloody hands stain? Unmoving, waiting for the end of night. Because in pain you die to set me free, I give my life in recompense to thee. That's amazing, Maria. J James, was that the poem, the song that you were talking about? Yes. You said a perfect devotional song? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I just spent the last extraordinary. week John Donne and George Herbert, and, and Maria's up there. <laughs> <laughs> Maria, do you want to read us your second sonnet then? in recompense okay. for the, all the difficulties we've had. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this one is called Willing Forgiveness, and it it's more focused on the Blessed Mother. Um, With hammering on nails, the hills have rung. A guiltless shepherd punished for his flock. The inspiration Stabat Mater sung. The perfect man beneath his cross will walk. The king of all, they batter, tire, and scorn. A pauper's crown is fashioned for his brow, a sword for Mary's heart, for Christ a thorn. Through sinless death, our life he did endow. Thus Satan tries to quench the hopeful light. How after death could Christ forgive us all? But Mary turns to us, her sweet eyes bright. Come follow my dear son, her loving call. And still she loves us, kindness like no other. Sweet whip, sweet nail, sweet wood, sweet cross, sweet mother. Well, it's perfect for the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. Um, thank you so much. I, I want to close out, uh, first of all, and I want to make sure that Maria and Samantha both have time to read all of the praise that is pouring in here. And I want to finish with uh, the, the a comment by Susie. Um, which was a response uh, to Samantha's poems, but I'm sure she would extend to you as well. My heart sings for joy in this amazing gift to all of us who have longed for a return to beauty and grace. Samantha is a gift and a blessing. Thank you for introducing us to a return to true and magnificent Catholic teachings. Um, it, it, is a grace for us to be with you both, Maria and Samantha. We wish you the best and we look forward to seeing what uh, is next in your, uh, the, the gifts you are giving to all of us because uh, an artist's work is to make visible uh, things of the spirit that would otherwise slip under the muck of the busy everyday existence to give us form, which is a precondition to both beauty and hope. So it's a very noble calling that you have uh, among whatever call other callings the Lord wants for you. And we all very much appreciate you a great deal. And so until next time, my friends, and our next uh, event, I believe, is going to be uh, October 3rd, The Mass of the Americas by Frank LaRocca is going to Miami, uh, a PhD conducting student at the Frost School of Music, which I'm told is, being, is giving Juilliard a run for its money in terms of craft, is spending the year doing his dissertation on the Mass of the Americas. He went to Mexico City to do um, research, original research on the archives there about the, uh, uh, the experiences related. It's a twin tribute to Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception, patroness of the United States and Our Lady of Guadalupe, and it is magnificent. And if you go to, well, look in the newsletter and register, uh, it will, will send you the live stream link. And if you're in the Miami area, it would be worth going. Um, thank you, everyone. Good night. Until next time, until we meet again, may the Lord bless and keep you always. Happy birthday, Maggie. Yeah, thank you, Roseanne. Happy birthday. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Next time we come.
What? Uh, sorry, I'm I'm turning on my Zoom event oh, okay. and trying to pop. All right. I'm Maggie Gallagher and I'm the executive.